Hi, today we will be discussing advances in skin regeneration using tissue engineering. So a brief introduction, the skin is an amazing organ and it's actually the largest organ in the human body. And it has the ability to regenerate due to the presence of stem cells, unless there are chronic wounds. And chronic wounds require a little bit of human help to, uh, to heal in the form of skin grafts. However, these skin grafts can lead to quite a few complications. Uh, and these include the short supply of donor tissue for screen grafts, as well as uh, the difficulty of donor matching. And if there isn't a, a correct match, there can be immune rejection of the skin grafts where the body responds poorly to the skin graft and, and rejects that tissue. Um, also chronic wounds can never heal properly from a skin graft, which can lead to amputation and even mortality. So this is where tissue engineering comes in. Uh, tissue engineers are working to develop bioengineered and synthetic skin substitutes for better treatment of deep skin wounds, which we'll go into later on in this video. So a brief overview of what we will cover today. The first we'll discover the anatomy of skin. Second, we'll discuss wounds and the process of wound healing. Third, we will do an overview of conventional treatments, and then we will bring up the new approaches for tissue engineering in uh, skin regeneration and provide our concluding remarks. So first of all, let's discuss the anatomy of skin. So what is skin? And skin is composed of three layers. The first is the epidermis. This is the outermost layer of the skin. It provides protection um, because it is waterproof and a lot of those barrier-like properties actually come from keratinocytes, which uh, as they differentiate and mature, they, they die in this layer of dead keratinocytes, provide that barrier protection from chemical agents, biological agents, physical agents that may be trying to get into the body. Uh, this, also, this layer also contains melanocytes, which produce melanin, which filter ultraviolet radiation, as well as uh, Langerhans cells, which are part of the immune system. So the epidermis is really important. And the second layer is the dermis, and this is the thickest layer. And it functions mostly as connective tissue because it is largely made up of extracellular matrix, but it also contains fibroblasts, hair follicles, sweat glands, blood vessels, nerve endings, a lot of the things that connect you with your skin. And probably the most important of these for the dermis is the fibroblasts because these secrete collagen and elastin, which provide your skin with its characteristic mechanical strength and elasticity. Finally, the innermost layer of skin is called the hypodermis, and its main role is providing insulation and cushioning between the skin and skeletal structures. And it also functions as a sort of energy storage area. So to get into uh, wounds and the wound healing process, uh, there are about 70,000 burn injuries each year in the U.S. alone and 600,000 to 1 million 500,000 venous leg ulcer injuries each year in the U.S. And these come from poor circulation in the leg veins that can damage the skin and make it very fragile. All in all, this costs the U.S. $20 billion annually if you are considering all sorts of treatments, including closure of the wound, pain relievers, possible surgery, prevention of infection, and of course, skin grafts. So to get into what actually leads to these non-healing or chronic wounds uh, that require such heavy treatment, uh, it really depends on the wound area and the wound depth. The larger the wound is, um, the more likely it will form into a chronic wound. And mostly the, the chronic wounds result from wounds uh, that do not heal in an orderly or timely manner and thus do not have all of the components that make our skin our functional skin. So the most common causes of non-healing wounds are vascular insufficiency. So if your wound does not get enough, enough oxygen from the blood, uh, local pressure effects, uh, simply the wound cannot peel due to the pressure that is on it. Uh, if patients are suffering from poor nutrition, uh, poor immunology, or if they have other conditions such as diabetes, uh, these are more likely to lead to chronic wounds, as well as aging which uh, reduces the elasticity of the skin and can make what would be an acute wound in a young person a chronic wound in an old person. Uh, 
Um, and so now I'll be talking to you about wound healing. Um, and so for uh, skin wound healing, this uh, comes apart in three or four phases. Um, the first phase is the inflammatory phase. This also includes the bleeding phase shown here in the diagram. This lasts for up to four days. And so what happens here is that uh, blood rushes to the wound and forms a blood clot to prevent any fluid loss. Um, and so this often causes inflammation and redness, um, and it prevents any infection and removes dead tissue. And then the phase after that is called the proliferative phase. This phase often lasts between five to 20 days. Um, and you can see here that it's beginning to heal around this area and new healthy tissue starts to form. The last phase is the remodeling phase or the maturation phase. Um, and this takes uh, anywhere from months to years to fully occur. Um, and so you can see it ends when there's freshly healed skin. Um, but sometimes instead of having it heal properly, like it does here with the fresh um, and proper regular skin, um, instead scar tissue forms. And so that scar tissue is usually what takes longer. That's what takes uh, months and years to properly mature. Um, and so after this, we'll be talking about the conventional treatments to treat wounds. Um, so the first type is autografts. These are taken from patient's skin from any other part of the body and then goes through this device to puncture them and make it easier to cover. And then um, they are placed on top of the area of the wound. This is recommended for deeper dermal wounds because these heal much more slowly and inadequately on their own. Um, and so the healing here depends on the thickness of the dermis in the graft. Usually thicker is better. Um, and what's nice about this is that the donor sites can be reharvested multiple times um, and that it's made of the patient's own tissue, so there won't be any immune rejection. Another type are allografts, and so these are taken from a cadaver. This helps overcome any limitations of the donor tissue um, and could, could, because cadavers can be used as they're needed since they're frozen. These uh, help revascularize the wound by promoting, uh, by providing a barrier, uh, promoting angi angiogenesis. Um, it also provides growth factors and essential cytokines to speed up the healing process. Um, it allows for, uh, it creates basically this temporary cover, uh, but it has to be temporary because of the fact that it's um, another person's body, so there's always a chance of immune rejection um, or virus transmission. And so after we use the allografts, then we kind of, then we go and use the autografts, which is the technique that I talked about just now, um, and that's used after allografts. Um, and so another type are xenografts. These are using animal grafts. Uh, these are obviously temporary because it's not human skin. Um, and so what's really beneficial about this is that it fuses extra collagen into the wound. And so collagen really helps with the regeneration of the dermis. Um, and so these are usually perfect as the first surgical wounds because they absorb into the skin as the wound heals. Um, and so most commonly we use pig skin for burn care. Um, and so the last type of the traditional um, graft treatments is the amnion. This is taken from the placenta, not, not the fetus. Um, and so these are for primarily partial thickness burns, like facial burns. Um, and they're one of the most effective biological skin substitutes. Um, it helps to reduce the loss of proteins, electrolytes, and fluids. Um, it decreases the risk of infection. It accelerates wound healing because it's rich in collagen and other growth factors. Um, it lacks immune, uh, excuse me, it lacks immunologic markers, um, which means that there won't be any immune rejection. It has um, antibacterial properties and it can reduce pain on application. So this is one of the most beneficial and helpful skin grafts. Um, but it, it is taken from a placenta, which is a very limited quantity available. So now I'm going to talk about newer approaches for tissue engineering. First, I think about what an ideal skin substitute should be like. 
Um, here are some requirements. First, it need to be thorough, barrel-like, and no inflammatory response, non-toxic, allow water vapor transmission like normal skin, and need to have similar physical and mechanical properties, and etc. And from a logistical angle, it need to be easy to handle, inexpensive, long shelf life, and low storage requirement. And in the, the paper introduced three approaches for tissue engineering. There's so co-culture, cultural, epithelial, autograph, and tissue engineer skin substitute. So for the cell co-cultures, um, the work is progressing toward co-culture cells for tissue generation that involves keratinocytes and fibroblasts. Uh, Keratinocyte sheets of stratified epithelia can be reconstructed from human epithelial cells, and fibroblasts can be added to keratinocyte sheets. Fibroblast cell can stimulate keratinocyte growth and differentiation by other spreading soluble growth factors or via cell cell contact. And the second one is cultural epithelial autographs. So um, for in this, the coronavirus cell from small sample of skins and ex expanded into sheets and co-cultured um, moss fibroblasts. And it is usually used in burn care and for some in the early 80s. And the last one is tissue engineer skin substitute. Mm, it is a good alternative for donor graft. It acts as a temporary cover on once to protect from fly loss and contamination and encourage growth by release of cytokines and growth factors. However, mm, this approach is quite expensive and And the figure here is a um, tissue engineer skin substitute preparation, the process of that. The bold lines indicate cell type of for tissue engineer substitute, and the dotted lines indicate cell source. And now it's about types of skin substitute. The paper introduced three types of skin substitute. The first is a cellular skin substitute, and mainly it's really uh, used as a temporary skin substitute for superficial or mid-dermal dermal partial thickness wounds and burn, and it also be used for donor size and congenital, congenital diseases. And it usually consists of a nylon mesh or collagen acting as dermis and a silicon membrane as epidermis. And the second one is cellular allogenic skin substitute, which is mainly produced using living neonatal foreskin fibroblasts with a mesh or a matrix. And the last one is cellular autologous skin substitute, which is a more permanent skin coverage. And there are generally two types of this. One is CEA and the other one is CSS. The CEA stands for cultured epidermal autograft. Um, it's the culture of autologous keratinal size, and it requires a delivery system or a supporting dressing. And the other CSS, which stands for culture skin substitute, is a autologous graft with both epidermal and dermal components. It acts as a permanent coverage with well-formed dermal epidermal junction, but this one is quite expensive. So last, I'll talk about the limitations. Um, the current skin substitute has reduced vascularization, poor me mechanical integrity, and failure to integrate scarring and immune rejection. And also the current skin substitute is really time consuming. Like it really it really takes like weeks, like two to four weeks to prepare the skin substitute, which is a long time for a one, right? 
And also, it is quite expensive and might not be affordable to a lot of people. So, based on the limitations, the future of skin substitute might be like to increase the lifespan and provide better integration with host tissue. And it can use bio re reactors to provide mechanical stimulation necessary to develop mature blood vessels. And the last is it can like mm, develop standardized standardized production process, which will uh, reduce the manufacturing costs. And this is all about our presentation.